There are some days that are just so exciting to celebrate, and this is truly one of them, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So I'm so glad that everyone's able to be here. I was so delighted to see somebody show up for breakfast, how wonderful that is to fellowship together. And I hope at this time we'll be just drawn close to our wonderful Savior and just uh, reflect upon all that he has done. So let's take a moment and have a word of prayer, and we will have our Easter message. My Father, thank you so very much for this opportunity that you have provided for us. Lord, once again, I just think about people around the world, uh, especially in worn toward areas of our world that cannot, cannot sit down peacefully and joyously as we have uh, this day. But yet, regardless of the circumstances, I know those who are true believers can have a joy in their heart and celebrate Christ. And I'm so grateful that we can gather together this day. And I do want to pray a great blessing upon each and every one who's here today and for those who are unable to be here today. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for each and every one. I do want to pray that you just bless us and encourage us and strengthen us in yourself today. And we just want to pray that the Spirit of God will open up minds and hearts to the wonderful truths that you have for us this morning. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. You know, as a Christian gets on in life, he should find his deepest human connections transferred one after another to a sphere that actually is beyond the senses and beyond time. For one after another, loved ones are withdrawn. The grandparents of our youth, the friends and family that we grew up with, the friends and family of our adulthood, and those of our twilight years, one after another, they reached the brink. There maybe is a bit of a hesitation. It may be perhaps for a moment, and it seems that they might actually return and recover. But the hour strikes, and they depart. They join the company of the dead. All here remains as it was, at least for a while. Their home in which they dwelt, the clothes they wore, the enterprises in which they were engaged in, the faces that they loved, all these remain, but they are gone. They have disappeared. Their bodies are beneath the sod, returning to dust. Genesis 3, 19. In sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's the plight of man. And if you look at all of human history, this is what we've experienced, right? Humanity has seen this over and over and over again. But what of their souls? We've seen bodies disappear. What of their souls? That which once flashed through their eyes, that which was felt for a manner of time, uh, in the tone of their voice, as well as in their thoughts and in their actions, where is that part of them? Is it to become absorbed into the atmosphere and be lost as well? Has their personality and their consciousness just simply perished? like vapor, or has it a momentary flicker in time just sunk back into the abyss of nothingness? Is there life only alive in our memories, which will also one day perish and be lost forever? Oh, dear Christian, Rejoice, for we do not live in such a pagan darkness of the abyss or of the saved loved ones who have perished into nothingness where a conscious soul is lost to non-existence. 
or a material body that is only subject to corruption and things perish forever. That is not us. We live the life of light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The sacrificial message of Easter is this, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified and then buried that he was raised from the dead in his body, that he came out of the tomb a complete personality. He left his grave totally empty, but the grave closed. By the word resurrection, we do not mean that our Lord's spirit continued to live without his body, but that he was actually raised from the dead by the glory of the Father and came forth from the tomb in the very same body that he had been crucified on Calvary's cross with. In that body, that very body, now glorified, he sits at the right hand of God the Father and that in that same body, and he is coming again as the judge of both the living and the dead, the saved and the lost. And we will face him and see him with nail-pierced hands, nail-pierced feet, wound in his side. But he's coming back. Acts 17 says this, then certain Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encounter him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of a foreign god, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Truly these things of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Also, in John 5, 25, we have this. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. In verse 25, this verse we just read, who are the dead spoken of in this verse? Who are they who would hear the voice of the Son of God and actually live? Well, there's a few possibilities. This may refer to those people who were raised from the dead by the Lord during his public ministry. And there are several people that Jesus demonstrated he had power over death over. He raised a number of people from death to life. Or possibly, this refers to those who were raised from the grave at Christ's resurrection. Matthew 27 says this, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, 
Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. In this section of scripture, we find six providing miracles of God that actually gives meaning to the cross. In verse 45, darkness fell upon all the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And the sixth hour was at noon. And the ninth hour, 3 p.m. And it was dark. And when the darkness began, Jesus had already been on the cross for three hours. The cross was a place of immense divine judgment where the sins of the world were poured out vicariously. In other words, acting on the behalf of another, on the sinless, perfect Son of God, Son of Man. It was therefore appropriate that great supernatural darkness actually expressed God's reaction to sin in the act of his judgment on Jesus. The second miracle occurred at about the ninth hour, or 3 p.m., as Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Upon becoming a man, Jesus had been separated from his divine glory. Now he would be separated from the intimacy of fellowship with his heavenly Father. There was no separation of his nature, his essence, or his substance as God, but there was a separation of loving fellowship. No one understood the depth of the alienation Jesus was now going through. The insensibility of the people that were now taunting him comes out as they thought he cried for Elijah and thus remained to see if he would actually come to save Jesus from the cross. They had no comprehension, not at all, of the aloneness and the separation that sin brings as it separates from God. But Jesus experienced that for you. A third miraculous happening at the cross comes as Jesus cried out, it is finished. Three glorious, wonderful words. It is finished. Scripture says he yielded up his spirit. And the work of the Father had sent, that he had sent him to do had been accomplished and was now complete in its totality. He had been beaten. He had been scourged. A crown with thorns nailed to his, his head. He, was, had been, he had been nailed to a wooden beam and had hung there in agony for several hours, being judged for our sin. Now, you would have thought that his life would have gradually faded away, ebbing little by little until it was just simply gone. But no, that was not the case. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' life was not taken from him. Rather, he surrendered his spirit by a conscious act of his own sovereign will. John 10, 18 says this. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. 
This command I have received from my Father. On the cross, Jesus gave his life. Men did not take it from him. He gave it for you. The fourth miracle that occurred on on the cross or on this time is found in 2751. This was not on the cross, but this happened after the cross. The veil of the temple was actually torn in two. Now, you know, we read these and we don't think about, but this is a, you know, this is a four-inch piece of material that's woven together, and there's no way you're going to be able to rip this thing in half. But that's exactly what happened. A huge woven veil separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, where once a year a high priest was allowed to actually pass through this veil on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle blood on the altar for the sins of all the people. When Christ gave up his spirit, a once for all blood sacrifice was completed, and the need for a veil was no longer in existence, no longer needed. The law's demands for death for sin had been met. It was finished. By trusting in Christ's finished work on the cross, one can now come to God directly without need of a priest, without need of sacrifices, without need of rituals. Consequently, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom by God's miraculous act because the barrier of sin was forever removed and paid for for those who put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. A fifth miracle that actually occurred at the crucifixion of Christ was a supernatural cause earthquake. Now this was yet another very important statement concerning Christ. A devastating earthquake is not a sign that all is well. David sung of the earth shaking when the Lord became angry. Isaiah spoke of the Lord punishing his people through thunder, earthquakes, and loud noises. Jeremiah spoke of venting his wrath on the nation of Israel by cursing and with quaking. The book of Revelation tells of God causing the mountains and islands to be moved out of their place. At the cross, God shook the earth at the death of Christ. He gave the world a foretaste of what he will do when one day he shakes the earth in judgment at the second coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The sixth miracle at the crucifixion is related to the previous previous one as a supernatural quake that only gave the world a foretaste of divine judgment, but it also caused many, many tombs to be opened. Matthew 27. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. A great miracle occurred as many bodies of the saints that had died were raised. Now, there are two kinds of resurrection in the Bible. Two kinds. There is one kind that deals with life, and there is another kind that deals with torment. Daniel 12, 2 says this, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to to shame and everlasting contempt. Revelation 25 says this, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
The first resurrection has several resurrections that are providing life. So you see it with Jesus when he rose people from the dead. You see that a few times in the Old Testament when some of the prophets raised people from the dead. There's only one resurrection that leads to torment at the end of the millennial kingdom. But what we have in our text are those who are raised to life, life. And this, this did not take place until after Christ rose from the grave because scripture states that Jesus is the first resurrection of those who are asleep. And when you see the word asleep, it's not talking about soul sleep. It's talking about the body being asleep. Why is it asleep? Because it's going to wake to life. There's going to be a resurrection for the believer. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the fact remains, a select group of believers, graves, were open at his death. And from those same graves, after Christ's resurrection, there were raised, there were people who were raised from these graves and they appeared to many. Now, can you think about this? Just Take a moment, and I want you to think about this. How many are going to have an Easter dinner today? A number of us are, right? We had a great breakfast, but we're going to have an Easter dinner. Now, what would you say if grandma and grandpa showed up at your Easter dinner, and they had been dead for 20 years? Would you have a pretty great celebration or what? These people rose from the grave and they went into Jerusalem and they probably exposed, exposed themselves to people who knew them. And here they were alive and who knows how long they've been dead for. The appearance in bodily form not only testifies to Christ's resurrection, but also to God's promise to bodily raise all those who have put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 53. <clears throat> For as in Adam all die. That's the way we started the day, right? In Adam all die. Even so in Christ all shall be made alive. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? immortality. And so in the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is believed, and he is received by sinners as Lord and Savior in repentant faith. Life and immortality is brought to light. God's grace provides for the immortality of man in his completeness. The immortality of a soul with Christ, but at a point in time, the immort immortality of a glorified, resurrected body that once again is reunited with the saved soul, that which was wretched away at the physical death will be eternally lodged together before the Savior. And with solemn certainty, we who are the born again of God, but have not yet made this transition, will meet our friends and our loved ones not as formless, unrecognizable ghosts, 
but with the features and expression that were part of who they were. Christ's resurrection is the model as well as the warrant for our own resurrection and of those who are believers that have gone on before us. This, then, is an occasion of great rejoicing, great thankfulness and joy, for we shall join our Lord and our saved loved ones who have passed from our sight we can look forward to the hour when we, unworthy but repentant in faith, will join them. And beneath the throne of our risen Lord shall worship together and behold and embrace the features which were loved on earth with our Lord. How can we but exclaim with utter gratitude, Psalm 30, 11. Thou, O Jesus, has by the resurrection turned my heaviness into joy. Thou has put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. We who believe in the resurrected Jesus have an access to God that is wide open and we are assured by God himself of living in his eternal and indestructible kingdom, in eternal and indestructible body together forever. With this, he turns our heaviness to joy, our loss to gain. Out of death comes eternal life for your soul and your body. For all that believe and have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He is alive and so are all those who are his. Let's pray. Well, my Father, you are all about life. You came to bring life. You hate death. You've destroyed death. Oh Lord, I just pray that each and every one here truly knows the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And Lord, that we would take this great, glorious, resurrected message and share it with whoever who will hear. And I pray that there will be many who will hear, for there is so much ahead for each and every one of us. It'll be death or life, and I pray that it'll be only life for those that we love, those that we care about, those who are enemies, those who are strangers, those who are neighbors, those who are relatives. I pray that it's life, only life in Christ. Through Jesus we pray, amen.